the Joe Rogan experience. The book, first of all, look how good you look in there on the cover there. You well, it's young, an old shot. Young, handsome bastard. Look at you. Yeah. Looking good there. What, Actually, what year is that a, from? It was 1968, November. Wow. I'd just come off the last mission in Vietnam. Wow. It was on a hilltop. We got stuck uh, in the rain in the Ashau Valley. It was the 1st Cavalry. And uh, we really, the helicopters couldn't get in for 11 days. It was awful. Wow. We had leeches everywhere. Uh, we, and the enemy, we didn't know where they were, but we felt that they were going to close in. It was, but it was too wet, ultimately, for them to close in. But they knew we were there. So we were praying. <laughs> The whole time was kind of nerve-wracking because it was my last few days, you understand. I was supposed to get out of there with Deros, leave the country. I was due out. Uh, I, had volunteer, I had volunteered for an extra three months in order to get out of the Army three months sooner. Wow. In other words, they had, there, normally you had to serve, uh, if a two-year deal, you had to serve six, six months stateside on the backside of it. So uh, I didn't want to do that because I was going nuts with the rules and the regulations, and I'd gotten into some trouble with that. So I extended in combat for another three months, and that ended up in this mission. How much did your time serving impact your your directing? And you, like you, you've had these life experiences as someone who's just a filmmaker, they, they really can't draw upon. Like you, you've had actual combat experience, and when you're making movies about combat, I mean that has to be a, a, a gigantic advantage, or at least it it adds layers to it that are almost impossible to create to recreate for someone who's just trying to imagine what it's like. Yeah, and that was very important when we did Platoon. I, I, I was trying to get the exact distances. And what and the amount of firepower is not as usual. It's not as intense, generally speaking, as the movies make it. Yeah. And that's the problem because the movies have so much to pl you know so much to show. They bring the enemy much closer. They they condense things and they they amplify as much as possible. Now I did that too here and there, so I'm I'm guilty too. But I think overall it's way overdone. And uh, the newer stuff that's come out since 2001. You know, with the patriotic stuff and heavily, heavily militaristic stuff, is way off, way off, and uh, people don't die that way. Like you know, in the uh, type of films like Mark Wahlberg made, or you know, those kind of films, they just way, way overdone. Anyway, in what, in what way? Like, well, uh, what was the name of the film? Lone Survivor. Yeah. Was that the name of it? Yeah. Yeah, they get dropped off, whatever, ten guys, and they manage to kill how many Taliban for each guy? You know. Uh, How much of that was based on? I mean, it's all about Marcus Luttrell's yeah, life. Exactly. I haven't had a chance to talk to Marcus. Although I'm friends with him, but I, I don't know how much of it they they monkey with everything. Whenever it they make way a movie, overdone. it was way overdone. They and the, what I've heard and what's been reported is that they you know they got trapped right away. It was pretty quick. And the ambush went on, and they, and they got the, they got the shit kicked out of them. So and. Uh, you know, I can't. I can't be. I don't remember exactly the details, but he did get away, and yeah. some people did scam, scam. But it doesn't look like it does in the movie, where mm -hmm. everyone's a hero. Right. That is a problem, and that's one of the things that I really loved about Platoon. Everyone wasn't a hero. Yeah. I mean, the the Tom Berenger character. Yeah, he existed. It's in the book. Yeah. It's based on a guy called Sergeant. Well, I called him Sergeant Barnes, but he had. A, I wouldn't use his real name. Real guy, getting shot in the face. And was uh, scarred, distorted, kind of handsome like that. But he was a serious guy, and he knew what he was doing. He was the leader of the platoon. See, I I made clear that the the leaders of the platoon were not really the lieutenants; they were the the platoon sergeant and the and the uh, squad sergeants, and uh, they were very important in our lives. So I rarely saw officers. I was dealing you know, in the jungle. You deal with what's right in front of you. So the sergeant was crucial. Barnes is a crucial character. So is the other character, Sergeant Elias, played by Willem Dafoe, was the, in another unit. that I had combined four different units. I was in three combat units. I combined them into one, one unit, one platoon for this movie purposes. So the Willem Dafoe character was also based on a real person? Yes, he was. He was based on a guy I knew in the Lerps, Long Range Recon Patrol, who was a great guy. He was an Apache, kind of an Apache Mexican uh, mix. Of, uh, I'm not quite sure what he was because I didn't get to know him that well, but I admired him because he had that lithe grace of uh, a guy who fought a lot, had been around. He'd been, a, he'd been in before. He was on a second tour, and 
uh, very much a love, a beloved figure. And he was killed after I left the, the unit. Uh, he was killed about a month later in a friendly fire accident. You know, friendly fire is, we talk about it in yeah. the book quite a bit, you know, because it's also underestimated. People never, the Pentagon cuts it all out, especially in the movies that come from the Pentagon approval. Right. They, they, they don't like to emphasize how difficult, how often, I would say 15 to 20 percent of our casualties in that war were friendly fire. Wow. Now, that's not just ground fire. From, when you get into a jungle situation, you're close to people. You don't really know where you're shooting sometimes. You don't know where the, where the incoming fire is is coming from. So it's quite a mess. It's chaotic. The radio, people screaming, shouting, noise, confusion, and a lot of fear. Yeah, that was highlighted for us when the Pat Tillman uh, incident yeah, happened. Yeah, very important one. Pat and Tillman, who is this uh, spectacular athlete, decided to postpone his NFL career and, and go over and serve and was killed in friendly fire. And it wasn't really reported that way for a while. That's absolutely correct, which is the point, is that they don't, yeah. they, they really don't want the parents to know what's really going on. So if, imagine if, imagine 15, maybe 20 percent are dying from that friendly fire. And that's, this is not just ground fire. This is, of course, bombing and certainly artillery fire, because that is often misplaced. It's not that easy to get the coordinates down in a tense situation where you, you can hit your where artillery 20 miles away, 40 miles away has to hit, uh, hit, has to hit the spot. When you're making a movie like Platoon, and this is in many, in much, much of it is based on your actual real life experience, how much preparation is involved in that? And how, much, how much is it different than when you're making another movie? Because this is something that's intensely personal to you, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, how much preparation? Well, I got I got uh, a great m combat advisor. He'd been there as a Marine, Dale Dye. Uh, he came in out of the blue, and uh, he he was a real uh, lifer type. So he remembered all the details in, of uniforms and uh, fire and the and uh, the firepower. I mean, it's, it's it took a lot of details to put this together. Uh, but the preparation was I'd been doing it for ten years. I started the picture in 1976. I oh, wrote wow. it. I wrote it. It wasn't made. It was rejected by the by the uh, powers that be the first time, and then it was uh, it was considered great great script, but too real you know too realistic, a bummer, a downer. If you remember back in the seventies, they had Apocalypse Now and Deer Hunter. Yeah, those were big films and mythic, beautiful films, but they were not realistic. Then they had uh, Sylvester Stallone do his uh, Rambo series, where he goes back and fights the war again. Do those drive you crazy? Yeah, <laughs> although the first one was pretty good. Uh, but the first you know, one was different. They're playing up the you know yeah. the, the whole sympathy card, the pity card. P yeah, I don't buy that. You know that there's a lot of that veteran feeling that you know it was, we were we were we were beaten. We had our hands tied behind our backs and we couldn't win and that kind of thing. Believe me, uh, it was a badly conceived war with a lot of misinformation. I go on in the book and talk about the lies that were spread by the military, the propaganda that were winning the whole time. The, they were using the body counts, heavy body counts. And we'd say, well, if we're killing so much, so many of them, they're not going to be that many left. And but on the other hand, as the years went on, more and more of them kept appearing. So they, the Vietnamese were indestructible in a way. They were like ants. They were. They were fighting for their independence, they're for their land, man. It was their country, and uh, they never gave up, ever. I mean, you could have nuked them, and I, that's what Curtis LeMay at one point suggested. You could have dropped a nuclear bomb. It wouldn't have, done, it wouldn't have made the difference. Thank God they didn't. But uh, America went to extremes to win that war with poisoning, the, the bombing, uh, the bombing of, of not only Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia was intense. Intense, bigger, bigger the, by far than World War II for this crazy war. Well, it also it set a precedent for our lack of trust in the military, a lack of trust in the government that guides the military, particularly in how they deal with the veterans that are dealing with things like Agent Orange, or you know people that have uh, come back that were that were sick, where they denied that this was part of the problem. Sure, we didn't even have PTSD. We didn't we yeah. know what that was, but. 
it started to crop up when I got back. And I talk about it here a bit about PTSD, which I'd never heard of, but I think we all had it. What did they call it back then? Shell shocked or? Nah, I guess so. But it was not it was not a diagnosable, diagnosable. It was not an ailment that you could uh, officially uh, catalog because if you did, the Army would be admitting to a huge amount of insurance problems and all kinds of medical problems that they would have to cover. So it was, you know, it was something that there was no word for it. But frankly, uh, to get back to the issue of the original question was the platoon was rejected on for these two, it almost came to be again in 1983, it fell apart again, and it's a heartbreaking story, it's in the book, and uh, uh, it's resurrected, I mean, I forget about it, I just put it in the closet after those movies came out, I said, they, they don't want to know about Vietnam in, in this country, they really forget it, it's not going to happen, fine, I, I live with it, I was moving on with my career, I had Midnight Express, I had... Scarface. I, I was. Uh, I had other things in mind. I, but uh, Michael Cimino, who had directed the uh, Deer Hunter, uh, told me he wanted to produce it with me as the writer, as a director, and that uh, we would it would we would resurrect it because he said Vietnam's coming back. I, I said that's nonsense. I don't think it's going to come back. He said, look at Stanley Kubrick's pictures. He's going to make a picture. It's called uh, Full Metal Jacket. And uh, it, did, it took three years or two years for him to make it. But the fact that he made it certainly gave us some impetus to make We made it very low budget. And uh, by the way, it was made by the same company as made Salvador, my previous film. They made him, I made him back-to-back in Mexico and the Philippines. Uh, back-to-back, financed, very low budget by Hemdale, a British company led by a gentleman named John Daly, who I might who was my mentor, I much credit him in the book. So uh, we were nothing film, no, out of nowhere. I mean, we were the, the bottom, I mean, we were in the Philippines and making a film that nobody really knew much about and at the bottom, you know, it, we were struggling to get it made and there was um, weather problems, there was all kinds of logistical problems, but we'd been through hell on Salvador, as I describe in the book, in Mexico, so we were a unit. By this time, we, we got used to the difficulties of making low-budget films. In between the time you wrote it and the time it actually got done, was there ever any effort by the studios to try to water it down or to try to doctor it up? And yeah. Sure. No, that went on quite a bit. Uh, everyone read the script at one point or another. Everyone rejected it. So and when it finally almost got made with Chimino in 1983... Uh, we thought we were in. We thought we'd get it made. No. But uh, the, uh, the the resistance to it at the very end with the MGM was supposed to be the distributor, and Henry Kissinger was on the board of directors along with uh, Haig, Alexander Haig. You remember him? Mm-hmm. Military guy, Secretary of State, very bad-tempered. Though They were both on the board. And whether they went to that board, I don't know, but that's what the story, they cover their ass by telling me, we can't make this movie. We can't distribute this movie because... The board would be against it. Now, sometimes they say t- they tell you that without checking, but in this case, I don't know. Mm. So, as a result, the film fell apart again. This was a heartbreak. Did you ever think like maybe I can move it a little bit or change it a little bit, or would no. you just the stay Pen- fast? Oh, the Pentagon said to me, uh, "Forget it. We're not going to help you at all. And this thing is completely distorted." Mm. They were upset as hell about the fragging. I mean, that's to say, really? you know what fragging is? Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of that towards the end. I mean, it started in 67, 8, but there was more and more discontent when Lyndon Johnson pulled out of the presidency in March of 68. Uh, that was a big moment. I think all the soldiers, everyone kind of knew that this thing was not going to work out and who wanted to be the last guy to get killed in Vietnam. Right. And so I think 69, 70 were more and more fractions, more fractious, fractious, and there was more and more incidents. At one point, there was a Pentagon document that came out I've seen it, that said this situation in uh, in the Army is getting so poor, so bad, the morale is so low that it's, it resemble, it's beginning to resemble the French mutinies in 1917 in the World War I. That was uh, a big concern of the Pentagon. They knew they, the thing was not going to work. It was cracking from within. So we, we gave more and more, let's say, uh, more and more... Uh, credit to the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, and saying that they were going to take our place. We we're going to put more money. We put a fortune into them. 
South Vietnamese Army, like we're doing now with the Afghan Army. It's interesting when you look back. What year did Platoon come out? 80? We finally made it out in 86. 86. December. When, when you really think about it, you're only talking, you're not talking about that much distance, distance between that movie coming out and the Vietnam War ending. I mean, in terms of how we look at the world now. I mean, yeah. if we look at, it's 2020, if we look at 2000, that doesn't seem like 2003, that doesn't seem that long ago. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of the timeline you're looking at. Mm-hmm. And so, in a, in a lot of ways, it was probably very fresh in a lot of people's eyes, particularly people in the Pentagon. It was quite something when it came out. It was, a, you know, it was, a, it was like a bomb went off. I mean, mm. it went around the world, first of all. It wasn't just America. This film played everywhere. And was, uh, I guess, it was a shock at the time because it was more realistic than any war film that they had seen. And, of course, it was dirty. It got, you know, I mean, it was, we had drug use in it, which was, you know, a description of the division. There was a division in the uh, Army. We were, we were draftees, many of us. So it wasn't all volunteer, you know, and it wasn't all, like, gung-ho at all. It was a split. And I just... I, I, Descri- I showed the split as much as I could. Uh, I would be in the. I joined the camp with the people who were, I would say were anti-authoritarian. I wouldn't say they were anti-war because we didn't have anything like that going on. It was just the army sucks, the man sucks. You know, a lot of the black troops knew this, so there was a lot of dissension with the black troops too. Because when Martin Luther King got killed in April of '68, that had that had a negative impact over there. So there was a lot going on in the country, and people were seeing it, feeling it, and uh, new, new troops were coming in all the time from the country draftees, so we were, you know, you get a feeling for what's going on. Did the, mo- did the movie feel different to you than anything else you've ever done in terms of your obligation? Because I really do think that that was the most realistic, at that point, for sure, war movie ever made. And the, the one that left people with the most conflicted feelings... And just this this feeling of as much as you can relay it in a film with notable actors, that you 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 showed the horrors of war in a way that I don't think had ever been portrayed before in a film. Well, we got the details right. I mean, when you see a dead body and you see it being lifted into a helicopter, that's really looks like a dead man. And uh, yeah. you, you, the pain of death. I mean, you feel. The danger, it's its never what you think it's going to be. It always comes up in another way. It's like sloppy sometimes. And battle, and that's what I don't like about a lot of the movies, battle is often just confusion, breaking down. Things don't work. It's like Mike Tyson said, you know, you, uh, your plan goes out the window when you get hit in the face. its That's the way it goes. It, Never play. See, the Americans had a methodical way of doing it. We, we go into the jungle. We send the, the little guys into the jungle. They meet resistance, pull back, bomb, or artillery, do anything, take minimum casualties. That's not what the Marines did, but that's what the Army's idea was. And that it works to a degree, but it eradicates the whole. The, the bombing is, is very sloppy. And mm. Not only do you have friendly fire, but you have... A lot of civilians killed, too. Imagine when you finish your final cut of that movie, and it got re- that had to be a very strange, almost like you're, you're releasing a child. You're, you're, you, I mean, it, it, was, it had to have been so much more personal and so much, so much more significant. Yeah, I'd been through so much. I really, I didn't, I, I didn't think it was good. I thought it was a good movie. I thought it was a good script, but I didn't, think, I didn't expect anything. I had just done Salvador, which was about a dirty civil war down in the, in the Central America, in which America, again, supported some pretty bad guys, some yeah. death squads. And I showed that. And that picture had not done very well because it had been, America had been very little, in, no interest really in the Central American issues of the 1980s. Remember the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua? There was a lot of turmoil in Guatemala, turmoil in uh, Honduras, where I, I went down there to research uh, Salvador and what I saw in Honduras was the beginning of another Vietnam. That's one of the reasons I really committed to Salvador heavily. When I saw the troops, the American troops, now there were women, men and women, uh, young, in uniform, many of them, National Guard troops, reserves. They were there building up for this. Att- I think it was pretty clear that Reagan was going to attack Nicaragua. 
in some way. But it never happened because of a fortuitous accident when the CIA got busted for flying a cargo, uh, a cargo over Nicaragua. And it was a huge scandal that led to the Iran-Contra unraveling uh, with Reagan. So Reagan was unable to do what he wanted to do in, uh, in uh, Nicaragua. Although we had mined the port, we'd done everything possible supporting the Contras. All that pissed me off. In other words, it was like 20 years after the war, 15 years after the war, here I am back in Central America. I'm seeing the same thing. Young guys like me in a country, yet, uh, you know, just believing what they're hearing from their superiors. So you felt like this obligation to not just release Salvador, but also release Platoon as in Platoon, y- your experiences showing what the Vietnam War was really like and with Salvador saying, hey, this is happening again. Yeah, I did them simultaneously, except I didn't really believe I didn't believe Platoon was going to work, yeah. to come out, so I didn't have much faith in it. Well, when it did come out, how much of a surprise was it when uh, it was a giant hit? Well, I knew that in the moment, put it this way, the shooting was, you could tell from the young people, the actors and the their enthusiasm for this. They, there was a hunger. Uh, to They were so delight, delighted to become so, so, soldiers for the purposes of the movie. We trained them on a... 24-hour basis for two weeks, and it was a, it worked. I wanted them to get no sleep, uh, and, and Dale Dye helped me with that. We we put them in a bivouac training situation, but wow. a real one. I mean, where you don't sleep and you you basically pull in sentry duty all night. Kind of you have you split your duty with foxholes, three guys, and D- Dale would stage attacks and stuff in the middle of the night. Really? So they were nervous and they were they were tired beyond belief. Which is good. That's where you want them. So how did how did you plan this out? So when you were when you were about to start filming, you had it in your head. We have to make this more realistic. What's the best way to do it? And then no, you no. Did, from the beginning, we, from the beginning, the way I cast it, I wanted I wanted young people as much as possible in the in the roles. People who were fresh, who didn't look like they'd done other movies, right? And types. They were based on everybody I knew in my platoons. People from the south. Uh, a lot of people from the South, the people from the Midwest, a lot of uh, inner city people, uh, Chicago especially, uh, St. Louis, New Orleans. Um, and, uh, I, you know, Californians. And I try to mix it all up. But the whole idea from the beginning was that we're going to make this, with our little bit of money, we're going to make this as realistic as we could. So we planned it that way. We, the camp worked. We got the full cooperation of the Philippine Army and some shitty helicopters that they had, but very dangerous ones. But at least that was, it was a start. Had that ever been done before, the camp, the, the idea of having them Never. live I don't like think soldiers? So. I don't think so, because that had bothered me a lot. In, maybe in the old days, but I don't, I don't know of one. No. We, what, what made you fall on that? Like, what, why was that? Well, I'd lived it. Right. <laughs> I'd lived it, so I wanted them to, above all, I wanted them to be tired, irritable. It gives you a sense of what it's like. You know, there's bugs. There's heat. It's it's a jungle, and uh, it's. Uh, How did they respond to that? At first, they were a lot of bitching. <laughs> there was a SAG, uh, SAG, the SAG, yeah. SAG union said you you have to have twelve hour turnaround. So a few of them quit. Really? Yeah. Wow. But uh, they and we replaced them because I had a long list, waiting list of people that I'd seen over the years. Wow. Actually, Charlie Sheen was the bro- younger brother of Emil- Emilio Estevez, mm-hmm. who was my first choice to play it in 1983. Ah. And after the movie went peeled back to 86, uh, e- Emilio had gotten older, and I went with Charlie, who came of age about that time, was my age when I was over there. Oh, wow. So he was 19, 20. So, you know, that's what I, w- I wanted, those faces. Once you get the faces, you can train them. And... Uh, Barringer and Defoe were the oldest, and they, that helped enormously. They, they were the you know, anchors of, of the operation. When the film was this gigantic success, did, did that, how did that feel to you? Did that validate yeah. this idea that you had and, and holding on me. to it, it for so long? It shocked me. It shocked me. I mean, for years this had been rejected, 10 years, you know. I mean, I, I was sick of it. I was saying, I'm not going to make this movie because it's going to go wrong. You know, I didn't think it was possible. But because of uh, this, you know, Kubrick picture and the support of the English company, uh, John Daly, they 
they wanted to make it. This is news for me because all my life I'm fighting to make mm. a movie against somebody's wishes. All of a sudden, I got some people on my side. That's a big. That's a big difference. And the enthusiasm of the cast and Dale Dye and all these great people and my cameraman, everybody, they loved it. And uh, we made it. And frankly, we finished it. We did it on budget. Fifty it was fifty days. We went fifty four days. But that was in. We had the money in the uh, in the in the that 10% contingency. We finished it in 54 days, and it was tough. Uh, and we got out of there just in time because the monsoons came. And in the editing, right away, you could feel that people were reacting to it in a different way. We edited it. There was no... Uh, we, we, we edited it a little bit, but, you know, we played with it, played with it. You massage it. But right away, I would say from the first screening on, you could tell people were responding and saying, this is real. This is, I've never seen this. This is real. So it, it took care of itself in a way. I mean, they didn't put much money in. The distributing company was Orion Pictures, which existed at that time. They, they, put a, they said, we'll give it a quality release, a few theaters at Christmas in 86. And it opened huge. First day in New York, uh, there was a line of veterans, young, young, uh, veterans who looked young. I mean, not World War II veterans, young veterans. They were around the block at the Lowe's Astor. And uh, I wasn't there, but people told me that they were they went in quietly. There was a mute, mute and they sat through the film, and very little talk, very little anything. Not a lot of the gung ho stuff you hear. And uh, at the end of it, they were quiet, and they, some of them wouldn't get up out of their seats. Quite a few of them were sitting there still in their seats. You know, some were crying. It took off, uh, and then. It took off like I can't, I've never, you know, it's a phenomenon you rarely see in the world. It's like the top, third highest grossing film in America that year. And it was, it was a blockbuster because it, no children are allowed in, you know, and you don't have much of a, f a woman's audience at first. So you don't figure on these things, you know. Uh, it, it took off and kept going. And then the women started to come in the third week as, as it was getting more and more talked about. There was no stopping it. 